morning, everyone. I am going to be building on what Peace has talked about. This is a context I'm very familiar with, Nigeria and Lagos in particular. And I'm going to be trying to plant a very small seed of the possibility of using private equity to drive the delivery of public education in Nigeria. And I know that there are lots of women in the room, but I'm going to ask you to imagine that you're this dashing young man who we're going to call Ade, and he's got a swanky new well-paying job, and he's got lots of kids that he really wants to send to school, and he can afford it all, so why not? That was Nigeria in 1979. We were 19 years independent uh, with windfall revenue from our first oil boom, and primary education was made compulsory, and it was fine because we could afford it. But then oil prices fell and the primary education that was compulsory began to suffer some setbacks. Not to mention that the number of children to educate increased exponentially. We are now 180 million people in Nigeria and 60% of us are under the age of 25 years old. That's 108 million, 10 times the size of Sweden. But education is still compulsory and it's still free. Um, and this is really what it looks like structurally. The red band goes around the years that are free, six years primary education free, and three years junior secondary education free and compulsory. But the question is, how do we really fund it all? Because we really can't fund it with what Addy had at the start. So what we have is a multi-layered education governance system. We have various levels of government that manage various aspects of, of the education system. At the federal level, we have the federal government that looks at tertiary education, the state government looks at <coughs> secondary and regional education, and the local government looks at primary education. And that also ties into the way it's funded. So at the federal level, the federal budget, the federal government keeps 82% of the education budget and puts that into spending on higher education. But then they have an 18% that's allocated to matching grants. They ask states to bring some money and they match that to support primary education in states. They have a tertiary education trust fund, funds to construct Almajiri schools, funds to support nomadic education. And then we move over to the, the states. The states themselves then have funds to match what the federal government gives and then cover costs for junior, junior secondary education. At the local government level within the states, we then have additional funds that go into primary education. So you can see there's funds coming from all over the place, and sometimes they're lost in, trans in transition, um, and sometimes they're just not enough. But to be honest, the Nigerian government is, is making an effort, and we're making progress. So on the left here, I have a table that's showing that Allocation, percentage of, of the budget that's allocated to education, it looks low. UNESCO, rec UNESCO recommends 26%. We are this year 7% of our budget going to education. But in real terms, the, the value is increasing. Um, this year we had 605.8 billion naira allocated to education. That's about $1.6 billion. And the highest we've seen in the last, well, nearly 10 years but it's still inadequate. This is the state of education in Nigeria still at the moment. We have even more kids out of school. 11.3 million children are out of school in Nigeria. That's the size of Tunisia. There are only about 10% of classrooms that we need for early childhood education. There are only about 40% of classrooms we need for primary education. And the majority of our qualified teachers have limited or emergent teaching knowledge. If you look at the quality of education itself, about 60% of students who complete grade four and 44% of students who complete grade six cannot read or write in any language. So <coughs> I think it's fair to say that we cannot go on assuming that public money will be enough to solve all of these education problems. But before we go into what else can we do, it's a question of why is this significant? Why bother? Why think about another way to fund the education system in Nigeria? And it's because of the children. It's because their lives matter. And what happens with their lives really does matter. They deserve equity of opportunity and access to opportunity. And the 
competence and capability to make choices that affect their lives. But also within the policy context, internationally, we have the SDGs. We're all familiar with the SDGs. Quality education, no poverty, partnerships for the goals. And nationally, in our new Nigeria Economic Growth and Recovery Plan, the government itself recognizes the need for the private sector to participate in ensuring quality universal education. And indeed, the private sector has contributed extensively this shows a host of organizations, and, and this is just a, a little bit of the engagement that we're seeing on the ground. Organizations, companies, nonprofit organizations, even individuals who are looking to solve problems in education. And you have them in various sub areas, but also along the formal education process. Lots of companies and nonprofits looking to engage. But what is happening is in a lot of the instances, that value becomes eroded because it's short-term value. So what happens is when you don't have enough funds to maintain the, process, the, the progress that starts, then it becomes a burden to the communities you're trying to support and you go into negative value. So the question is how do we make that private funding that's coming in more sustainable and how do we help drive outcomes and efficiency in the system with that funding? And for this, I'm going to lean on Stephen Bohr in his book, um, Global Education Inc., where he talks about um, rewarding the business sector in business terms for their contribution to education. So it's, it's what is called philanthrocapitalism, and that is looking at new philanthropists that want to see a return on their donation. And they want to see clear and measurable impacts on the outcomes of their investments of time and money. And really, this is what has driven a lot of the world and developing countries as well into innovative finance models, one of which is social impact bonds that a lot of us are familiar with. And here, basically, the government enters a contract where it's bound to pay for improved social outcomes, and money is raised from socially motivated investors to support upfront payment for social service programs. And then when those are delivered, the government pays the investors back with interest. Um, as of January this year, there were over 100 social impact bonds in 24 countries worldwide. But the progress in Africa with social impact bonds is still slow. Mozambique tried a malaria performance bond in 2013, but eventually it was disqualified as an outcomes um, payment structure because the indices that were used were actually outputs, just number of bed nets. They were not outcomes. For education, the outcomes themselves are very important. They, and so what? After we get kids into school, after we put infrastructure in, like Peter said, and then what? What, what does that do to improve the lives of the children? We only have two other countries in, in Africa that have worked on designing impact bonds, and South Africa has about four and Uganda three, but we still have none for education. And the challenge partly might be that we're still thinking in terms of input and output, and we can't use that in driving social impact bonds where you need to price an outcome. So Lagos State, as an example, even though we've made progress with our medium-term sector strategy, um, once upon a time, not too far in, in the past, um, we didn't even have KPIs that were inputs or outputs related to outcomes. Now at least we have some KPIs that are based on outcomes, but then we don't even have the data and we, we're struggling with the capacity to get baseline data. So how do we move from there to measure improvements in the outcomes? And that itself is another big challenge in being able to use impact bonds. So with that, what other finance models can be used? What can we do to leverage private funds to get management expertise, to drive service delivery, to get the, the process to be results focused and to have the right incentives? And what I'm proposing is that we look to private equity. Why? Because private equity has been proven to drive sustainable business growth and to enhance business performance. But before I talk about the intricacies of what that might look like, I think it's a good time to remind you I'm not an expert in private equity. Maybe that's why I can see some of the, the benefits in learning from private equity. But I'm also not trying to present this as an oversimplified model. 
It's a complex thing, blended finance, that will require a lot of work and support in a system-wide effort. Also, this is building on the nuances of the Nigerian context and the way our government is structured and the way our financing works. And this is work in progress, and I'm hoping that this will at least spark some debate about what is possible. So building on that, this model really attempts to look at how we can utilize private funds for public education to incentivize investments, incentivize government accountability for funds and outcomes, drive allocative efficiency, protect public assets, but also protect the public good of, of, of education, even when investors come in with the need for profit. Um, and then also harnessing the managerial and operational know-how of private equity investors to drive efficiency in the system. And this is really what it looks like. I'm not really sure how, how well you can see this. But essentially, we have a, a trust that is structured as a management company, what is referred to as the Manco in this diagram. And that management company establishes the trust in itself, which is the fund that holds the resources and, and, and the, fi the funding. We have investors who essentially would be preferred to be impact-focused investors who put money into that fund. And the state government, where ordinarily it would budget for the cost per child, puts that funding also into the, the trust and transfers the holding, the custodial arrangement holding of public schools as assets into the fund. What happens is the fund and its fund manager engages a school operator who then manages the public schools, really building on what Peter said about local schools trying to, to manage public schools as local schools and get them to be more efficient. Part of the money that comes from making that more efficient really then gets some additional revenue that can be put back into the system. High level, that's what it sounds like. But a little more detail. What are the actual principles this is building on? The first one is we're borrowing principles from securitization. We're pulling assets to be, to be repackaged into interest-bearing securities. So we're pulling public schools as assets and saying, well, these can be cash-backed um, with money coming from both investors and the government. And we're saying that if the government transfers those schools in a custodial arrangement into the fund, that it shows that it's willing to ring-fence those assets and that that addresses some of the risk concerns for investors who might want to put money into the public education system. In addition, how does it work to invest in the public schools themselves? The, the fund manager would be working within the school operators to identify schools that could be invested in <coughs> and grouping those into tranches. They could do that using geospatial assessments to find where are the most children? Where are the least schools? Where is the need and how can we match the two? And then selecting those schools, then funds could be deployed for renovation, tuition, salaries, technology, etc. We've spoken to this a little bit already as to how do we then yield returns for the investors. Again, because it's too risky to invest in one school alone, Pulling schools into tranches, perhaps in terms of local government areas or, or geographical need, enables there to, to be a, an allowment to group investors and the schools in terms of risk and reward allocation. And introducing outcomes that then help to track what the school operator is doing to ensure that the outcomes are actually achieved and that they can be incentivized by paying for those outcomes. How do we exit the investment? I think that's one big question that private equity experts would, would ask. What I'm proposing is that we use a secondary buyout model, and that is that at the end of the life of that fund, we can transfer it to another fund manager, or we could use what Peter also was, was speaking about, pension <coughs> funds. So we currently have pension funds of the size of about 2.26, about $26 billion, um, and a lot of that goes into very safe government securities. But now there's some regulation that says a portion of that should go into other parts of the economy. And approximately 35% of that can be put into asset-backed securities. So that might be some funds that can be tapped into taking this off of private investors. And regulating it 
we're looking at quality assurance, but also some of our local laws in terms of uh, Securities and Exchange Commission management and the Nigerian Companies and Allied Matters Act um, to supervise legally what happens in that sphere. So I'll end by bringing us back to really what is the purpose of this intellectual exercise. It's that it has become imperative to find and support innovative approaches to financing education development in Nigeria in partnership with the private sector. And the real reason is back to this. It's back to the children. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.